Perfect. So good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to our virtual event tonight. It is um, World Imposter Syndrome Day, and as part of our uh, theme at WIMSA this year, we are looking to embrace some of the challenges that we all are facing and to have very bold, brave, and honest conversations as we unlock our most authentic selves through this journey that we're all on. Um, imposter syndrome is something that, God, I know I experience almost every day, and I think many people probably online and, and in our spaces as well experience it. So we thought this was a topic that we really wanted to explore as it's come up in so many of the mentoring programs that have been part of in the last few years, um, and a recurring theme in a lot of those discussions as well. So I'm going to hand you guys over to Fatima Hyatt, who's our WIMSA communications lead, who's going to run tonight's uh, session and introduce our panelists to you. Um, I urge you to please be interactive. Please pop your questions into the chat box. If there's something that you'd like to ask or like you want to discuss further, please just raise your hand and just get involved in the discussion. We would really appreciate that. Um, so thank you. Go for it, Fatima. Thank you. Um, thank you, Raksha, and good evening to uh, all of the listeners that have joined us this evening. Um, you know, I think this is such an important topic that doesn't get much um, discussion within our organizations, and we felt the need that um, we put this um, discussion out there and hear what people have to say that have experience in this field, um, and also just to get our listeners to interact with us and tell us how they are experiencing um, imposter syndrome in the workplace and perhaps how um, they deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you so much for your time and for making time this evening to join us at WIMSA. Um, I'm the communications lead for WIMSA, um, as Raksha mentioned, and it's really such an honor to be hosting this panel this evening. Um, I've got an amazing panel. Um, who will who will talk us through the imposter syndrome um, and share their insights on on this topic? Um, allow me to introduce my panel this evening. I'm just going to ask my panel to just wave um, at the, at the people so that they can see who's with us. Veronique Briefelmans, a coach and life passionista. I love that. Who holds a background in psychology, industrial psychology, communications, and is an endorsed is endorsed coach by the International Coaching Federation. So, very neat. Welcome. Okay. And then also part of our panel is Teho Majani, a customer success manager at Sequent, who is passionate about helping geoscientists to solve their most complex challenges using cutting edge solutions. Teho, welcome. Thank you for joining us on the panel. Um, Humlani Harvey, um, a regional SHEC coordinator for Fraser Alexander, who's passionate about mentorship and empowerment and lives by the philosophy of lifting those around her as she rises. Mulani, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. So welcome to um, this discussion. As we've mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to be talking to our panel, um, taking us through what is imposter syndrome. Raksha has put up a poll. So if you have time, I see, uh, if I look at the poll um, results at the moment, Raksha, majority of our uh, viewers have said, yes, um, they are aware. Um, we have some a couple of no's and some really, uh, um, I think so, I'm not really sure what it is. So I think you're in good hands. And as Veronique, um, Veronique as a professional who deals with coaching of individuals, um, please take us through what is imposter syndrome um, and, and what you deal with in your line of work on a day-to-day -day basis on this topic. Okay. Good evening, everyone. So, so very happy to be here today. I've tried to, um, oh, I just need to share screening to be enabled. These. <clears throat> I've put, I put a couple of slides together just to make it a little bit more interesting so that you don't just see my face and and my voice talking. Um, and imposter syndrome is a very big topic. Uh, it's still disabled. I can't share the screen. It should be enabled now. Just check. Perfect. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. yes. Well, thank you. Awesome. All right, great stuff. So um, imposter syndrome as a definition is actually quite easy. 
but when you unpack it and go into the layers of it, um, it can become quite an extensive discussion. So I, I wanted to keep it simple, but also plant the seeds of how far it can go and what it ultimately comes down to. So I just wanted to start, we've already done a poll there, you guys have done a poll, but if you look at these, um, these, these items here on the screen right now, just have a look through it. Doubt yourself, fear that you won't live up to expectations, this yeah. desire to overachieve, taking on more than you really should when you know you need to say no, struggling to say no, difficulty with boundaries, maybe difficulty actually assessing your own abilities or skills, attributing success to external factors, so only thinking that you're worth something if somebody outside of you um, validates you or if you get a bigger salary or a bigger house. Um, attributing, sorry, agonizing over making mistakes. Like if you do something wrong, does it derail you? Or does it give you a lot of agony? Sensitive to criticism, putting yourself last and everyone else first being restless, nervous, on edge all the time, kind of having that sense of anxiety um, that's there all the time, a feeling of inevitably being found out, like if someone actually gets to know me, they're going to see I'm a fraud, procrastination, putting stuff off, having 100,000 to-do lists, but never actually getting around to 50% of them, downplaying your own expertise and skills, struggling to take or trust compliments when someone gives them to you, um, sabotaging your own success, setting yourself very challenging goals and then feeling extremely disappointed when you fall short of them, that drive for perfectionism, constant sense of anxiety, being labeled a workaholic, feeling mm -hmm. inferior to others, a sense of anxiety or depression that's hovering all the time and feeling like a fraud or a phony. So that's just a few of them. And you can see each one of these can be a discussion on their own. But um, I can't see all of you. Uh, let, me, let me minimize my screen for a second so that I do get a, a holistic view. Hands up to how many of us can relate to, to more than, say, 10 of the items listed here. So it's quite scary to think that practically all of us really to some degree or another um, yeah, could actually be suffering from a slight or not a slight case of imposter syndrome. So then what is this imposter syndrome? So the first thing is that it's flying around, a lot of psychologists, psychiatrists deal with it. Um, it isn't actually an official diagno diagnosis on the DSM model. The DSM model is what psychiatrists and psychologists use to diagnose people um, based on an American standard, which in itself is a discussion on its own because we're African and we operate quite differently. But it really comes down to um, something to do with the challenge of intellect and our own belief of our ability and our intellect related to a sense of achievement or worthiness. Um, so people that struggle with any one of these or variations of them, like the ticks we've just gone through, usually consequently would suffer with levels of stress and anxiety and depression too. And you can see that if you take one of the items on the list of the previous slide, or you go to a therapist or a psychologist, psychiatry with stress or anxiety or depression, you're likely to get put on meds, talk for days and never actually get anywhere. So a lot of people either don't have the time to do that, or they don't have the desire to do that because they fundamentally know that there isn't actually anything wrong with them, but there is this struggle inside. And linked to that is this, I don't actually want to talk about it because I might get fined out. So they suffer in silence and it becomes this vicious um, hamster wheel that everyone is on, right? So just to sort of bring it home and package it so that we can put it into some kind of a structure. And depending on, on which models you read or if you go research it, there are many uh, different labels and different types, but these are the five sort of common ones that you'll find. The first one that you'll come across, if the slide would move, why it's not working, oh, there we go, is the perfectionist. 
And I think we all know a perfectionist and how hard they make their own life and the lives of those around them. Every T must be crossed. Every I must be dotted. This person, in essence, has fundamentally high standards. Um, I know that I'm a recovering perfectionist. There was a time when I wouldn't leave the house without absolute perfect French manicures and heels and well-groomed hair and stuff. But um, on weekends, I now allow myself to, to let that go a bit. Um, but yeah, it's this desire to be perfect, absolutely perfect. Somewhere along the line, we got taught or we got led to believe that there is this, this intricate level of perfection that needs to be reached. There's this bar that is up here and it cannot move. It's not relative. It's up there. And unless you achieve it, you are nothing but perfect. It's either perfection or you're a loser. The other um, typically common one is called the soloist or otherwise known as the individualist. And this is that person that is afraid to ask for help. That person that is afraid to reach out or phone someone or say, I need some help here or there, because there's this belief that if I ask for help, I'm weak or I'm a fraud or people are going to see that I actually don't know my stuff. So there's this, this, um, there's this dissociation from their own humanity, because as human beings, we are born fundamentally flawed and we only learn from mistakes. Um, so that's missing. Then there is the third one, which is known as the natural genius. And this is a person um, who feels like a fraud if they don't believe that they're naturally intelligent or competent. They, they feel like whatever they tackle, whatever they do, they need to get it right the first time. And if they don't get it right the first time, they'll either procrastinate to do it or they'll be extremely hard on themselves if they make a little mistake or an error, because it's almost like there's an expectation that they need to know everything um, and do it right the first time. So it's very much linked to skill and ability. They feel like they have to be the master of everything. Then we've got the fourth one, which is known as the expert, very similar to the natural genius, but this is about knowing everything. So it's more about the knowledge being the, the one that's ranked the expert in a topic. So it's that person who's in a title or has a particular position and has linked to it certain expectations of that position. And if they're not delivering on every single one of those expectations, then they are a fraud or an imposter. They, they just have to know everything. And the last one is the super, the super person or the superhero. And I think moms by default in our world seem to often be superheroes because they just work harder. They take on more. Um, they just, they, they just feel that if they say no to anything and drop the ball on anything, then they just don't measure up. So they just take on more and more and more and more. And I think you can see from any one of these, the risk of burnout is so obvious, right? It's so obvious because each one is, is putting so much pressure, so much stress on themselves um, to be one of these five that there, there really is no space for themselves or the actual individual um, that you were born to be. And what they all have in common, the core emotion that underlies all five of these in a word is fear. And fear... Um, just like sadness and anger, is an emotion that is, um, it's not accepted in our society. You can't say that I'm scared. You can't say that I'm afraid. You can't say that I don't know, because then you're seen as weak. So we bottle fear. And fear, when it's not addressed and it's not tackled, can be extremely debilitating and crippling. And it ultimately becomes things like depression, um, like issues with anger, like issues with anxiety. And the fear that underpins these five imposters or how they often manifest is really that fear of being exposed, that fear of being humiliated or shamed, that fear of being criticized, of being incompetent, of being seen as stupid or unintelligent of being unwilling or unhelpful or selfish, very often linked to religious beliefs as well. That fear of being rejected or fired or not getting the promotion. That fear of being seen as a failure. And what all of these ultimately come down to, which very few of us wanna admit, is that inside of us, there's this little person that says, I'm just not good enough. 
there's something just off with me. I'm just not good enough. So in essence, imposter syndrome as a, as a title can become this topic that's over there that we can discuss for days. But it really refers to um, your experience of conscious or unconscious strategies or coping strategies that you've picked up to survive from childhood, which ultimately is not aligned with your authentic truth. Because every single person was born a remarkable 100% unique individual. In fact, there is not another person in this world like you. Whether it's a tree, a snowflake, or each one of us on this, on this screen here today, there is not another human being in the world like you. Not one. Not one. Yet we've been conditioned through indoctrination, through parenting, through media, through religion, through various other um, social systems, to be something and fit into that box. And if we don't fit into that box, then we are wrong. Then we are not whole. Then there's something wrong with us. And it goes against nature because every single one of us is unique, remarkable, and whole. So, so Nick, Veronique, sorry, just before you continue, I just wanted to perhaps bring in um, Tejo into this discussion um, because he shared some interesting points about him experiencing the, the imposter syndrome in his role um, that he's occupied um, through his career and perhaps just um, get some insight um, from him as to um, how did he identify that he was actually experiencing this. Seho, if you don't mind, Veronique, just to stop you there before you continue with the rest of your presentation. Thanks, okay. Fatima. And oh, thanks, Veronique. Um, a lot of those points actually resonate closely to me as well. Um, so, yeah, for me, it was more about you, you don't realize you have uh, or you're experiencing imposter syndrome until you go through it. Uh, at the time, well, my first job in geology, I signed the contract on Friday. And Monday, I was already in a buggy going to Zimbabwe for three months, um, doing mapping in the bush. And from there on, I think I was in the field for like three to four years straight. And when I came back to the office and I had to now meet clients and um, submit proposals and act corporate, you know, um, I found myself in, in, in boardrooms not knowing what to say. I have the information in my head, but I would just be quiet. And I remember this one time I was at uh, at Deloitte with my with my previous boss, and he was talking about everything. And I had this idea of how I was going to save this client money, and I was like, and the moment I said one thing, and I, I remember the, the the client even turned his body and started actually considering me as part of the meeting, you know. And that only, I only said, I think, one, one sentence. And I saw the difference that it took in, in the client's perception of me to say, okay, this guy's contributing here. And yeah. from there on, I experienced that uh, in, in boardrooms mostly. And yeah, it was, I, would, I, I wouldn't know it was imposter syndrome. But, um, yes, I yeah. Uh, and I think the reason why you wouldn't know that is, is something that I, I talked about earlier was that organizations don't often talk about imposter syndrome or or we don't advocate enough for it. So you read about it and, you know, you really have to, it's like a journey of self-discovery as we go along, um, especially starting out really young in your careers. And I think, Veronique, you would, you talk to the point of fear. Um, and I think that hits all of us um, starting out in a career where you feel like you're sitting in a boardroom full of people um, who are quite experienced and seasoned and you've got to present your ideas, but you have that self-doubt and that criticism of, of and the fear of failure, actually. Um, I don't know if, if some of your clients, uh, you know, come up with that as, as something that needs to be addressed early on in their careers where they have a bit of a, a, a you know, quite a good mentor to assist them through that process. Mm, very much so. Um, you've hit the nail on the head. And, and very often the problem is that you'll go to a therapist or a coach or even a counselor with that fear of failure or that fear of what if I get shown up. And you can talk for days about that. 
But ultimately, it comes down to, and, and, and I'll reveal it in a minute, this coping strategy that, that we've developed, which we've picked up somewhere along the lines in childhood, because you'd be surprised, there are people who are CEOs, CFOs, who've had 30 years of experience, who really are exceptional human beings that still suffer with this. So at the end of the day, it's not so much to do with what you know or your actual abilities, but your relationship with yourself, your belief in yourself, your love yeah. for yourself. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Now, now the slide went. Okay, there we go. So it's not that there's anything wrong with people or with ourselves. It's that the, if you compare it to like a computer system, okay, we're all born with a particular as a particular computer with a particular operating system. And in our first 10 years where we're very impressionable and we're like sponges, we pick up these, um, these, these ways of coping and our hard drive gets filled up with pictures and softwares and apps and all sorts of things. Um, and they're all well-meaning from all sorts of places. But then suddenly we start being sluggish and that, you know, if you've got a Mac, that, that rainbow wheel of death starts turning. Or if you're on a PC, it starts hanging and you've got to keep defragging and stuff. And you think, oh, what's wrong with my hardware? And you take it to the doctor and you go to gym and whatnot. But really what you need to do is get back down to base and go, what of the software and that stuff that I've installed in there is actually not aligning with my operating system, with this hardware that I was born with? Um, so the question then arises is where does it actually come from? Like, where do we pick this up? And 90% of the time, it's, it's in our family environment, our upbringing, um, where, there was, where there was usually a strong emphasis placed on achievement where we had parents that were like, you know, to be something in this world, you need to be a, a doctor or an accountant, or you need to be a suit, or you need to have um, a five bedroom house with, a, with three cars and your kids need to go to private school and you need to earn a fat salary. Um, and there's all this conditioning that comes, comes into that. Ironically, I think we all know it's the people that own the businesses very often didn't even finish school um, like your Richard Bransons and stuff of the world, who, who have incredibly high emotional intelligence, which is their relationship with their self, far exceeding their qualifications and their actual intelligence levels. Um, and there's very often not an emphasis on that during our schooling and our upbringing. But linked to family upbringing is also the style of our parenting. And parents often mean well, but they tend to often um, criticize or be very hard on us and give us mixed messages when we're growing up. So on the one hand, they'll bollock us if we didn't get 100% for our test, but then we get 90% and they'll be like, oh, you're so smart. And they go tell in front of your, your um, in front of the friends, like my kid's so smart, he gets like A's. But then when at home, you're like, oh, you bollocking me because I didn't get a hundred percent for my test. So there's these, these mixed messages that start playing a conflict within us that we pick up at a very young age. And then of course, there's also societal and cultural pressures that come from religion, from media. I mean, in the world today, I think we're, we're all exposed to what's going on in terms of sexual preferences, um, sexuality, um, you know, how people are working, kids rebelling against your typical schooling systems, lack of creativity, questioning religion, all of, all of these structures are, are, are wobbly right now. And we're all adults, we had a rough time. So can you imagine being a five or a 10 year old going through the same stuff we did in addition to all of these wobbly pillars? So basically it creates an inner conflict. And if you look at the little uh, picture in the bottom of the screen, there's the real you that you were born to be, that authentic, unique, remarkable individual that you were born to be. But then because of parenting, society, culture, blah, 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 we develop this mask, this persona to show up in the world and survive. And there's varying degrees of that. 
So we can become a pleaser or like, um, like Tseho was just now explaining, he started taking a back seat, keeping quiet, um, sort of, you know, almost becoming irrelevant and not saying anything because he was afraid that if he spoke up, um, he might get judged. So there's these coping mechanisms that we develop in order to try and keep the peace, in order to keep that sense of belonging, in order to keep that sense of I'm okay to be here. Yeah. So really, so, the, the it comes it comes so, down. The, sorry, oh. sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. There's actually a very a relevant question on the chat um, to your previous slide that says, "Can a work environment foster or breed imposter syndrome in an individual?" So um, whilst you mentioned family upbringing, parenting styles, um, societal and cultural pr pressures, and inner conflict, I mean, this is talking directly to a work environment. Uh um, I don't I don't think it would necessarily breed or foster it, but it can nurture it and contribute to it. The, the operating system we normally develop within the first sort of 10 years of our life. Um, you'll, you'll find that it starts it starts becoming into play when you're a teenager. So by the time you're in work, the wounding is already inside there. The, 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 the self-doubt is already within you. The fear yeah. of being shamed or ridiculed or criticized or fail or whatever is already in there. So you already bring those wounds into that work environment. The cool. irony, however, is that you'll usually have a boss or colleagues or whatever that will hold a mirror up to exactly those words because yeah. that's how life works. That's how the universe works. It shows you, it shows you where your wounding and your pains are. And we can either run away from that, which again is fear, or we can try and see, oh, I'm seeing a pattern here. There's something that I need to resolve, confront, or deal with. So and I think that on the question. Yeah, I think that answers that question. I think uh, what you mentioned is also quite important, is that when you have someone that mirrors that, you, you then um, start seeing more of that uh, within yourself. And, um, you know, then you can actually identify some of these um, symptoms within you. Um, Absolutely. And one of, one of the um, personas that we often create is to blame, to become self-righteous, um, you know, to gossip. The, these are all forms of resistance and denial that keep us away from our healing. There's a little saying, I don't know if you guys have heard it, but, you know, if you point a finger at someone, like if I'm blaming or I'm trying to tell someone is wrong or get all self-righteous, there's actually three pointing right back at me. So yeah. granted, the person may have done something wrong, but why is it showing up in my life? Why is it triggering me? There could yeah. be 10 people experiencing the same thing. And five of them let it go over their head or unaffected by it, maybe even motivated by it. And five of them may be derailed by it or go into a depressed hole or feel like they need to um, slate the person or take them to task or start fighting. And that, and that really is a sign of somebody who's in resistance and not willing to deal with the pain and the wounding that they're holding within themselves. I actually just wanted to bring um, Humlani into this discussion. Uh, working in a in at Fraser in a shack as a shack coordinator, um, be, being in a very industrial, um, male dominated, predominantly male dominated environment. Um, Humlani, just um, share with us um, your experience uh, with, and and having experienced imposter syndrome, how you dealt with that, or um, how you deal with that. On a daily basis. Um, thank you, uh, Fatima. Uh, just like you said, working in a men dominated environment. So uh, many a times uh, when I first stepped into the mining environment, I remember quite well, uh, I would feel that uh, I am a miner, I'm a miner. I, I don't know much about the mining environment. And those that have been there before me, they know better. So I tend to, I would tend to forget how I got there, all the hard work that I have put through, that I've put in for me to end up being there. All that will be consumed by the anxiety, the fear of being judged, the fear of what, how will they take me? How will um, they perceive the certain things that I'm saying? And when sitting in the meetings, you would find out you want to voice out, you want to raise a point and other people are raising the very same points. You end up telling yourself, 
oh, well, it's, it's all the same. They are raising the same points that I wanted to raise. So it's okay. My mind, it's like someone is reading it and conveying what I'm thinking, even though I'm not raising out. So how I started to deal with it was to just show up as much as I can. I would show up even though I am scared. I would raise my voice, even though I could feel that it's, it's, it's shaking, but I would still talk. And the more you, the more I, I found out that the more I talk, the more I raise my voice, uh, I find it easy. So uh, I, I guess it's, it, it is what they say, practice makes you perfect over time. And yeah. one of the challenge that I felt was uh, the perfectionist one, when I had to send a report, I would review it more than 10 times before I sent it through because I'll, I'll be at the fear of what if I got one wrong, one word wrong? How would they say, uh, what would they think of me? Instead, I'd forget all the hard work of studying and be making sure that I am this person that I am. So engaging as much as I can. And of course, uh, discussing with my manager always helped me quite a lot because I would raise with my manager. She was quite an open person. So I would raise it uh, that I've got anxiety when I'm in meetings. I've got fear of raising my voice and she guided me through showing up as much time, as much as I can. And perhaps just to pose the question to you, uh, when you look at um, the slide that Veronique shared about where does it come from? Um, have you ever explored that and, and thought about your upbringing or you know perhaps your your parents parenting styles or do you think you could you could look at societal and cultural practices i mean veronique mentioned uh, there are certain things like religious beliefs like cultural practices and i think that's very uh, prominent in our um, different cultures within south africa that we often find uh, people come up and say you know because of my cultural uh, upbringing and the practices it inhibits me being me and I have that certain sense of fear do you think that you could identify uh, where that comes from in terms of your experience definitely Fatima uh, as she was busy explaining that it took me back to my childhood I remember growing up um, my mom would say that uh, you play like a tomboy you're supposed to behave like a girl so at home I was surrounded by by boys I've got brothers my little sister only came after seven years so I had to play with them. I had to be like them. But I would get a hiding now and then on saying, girls don't get on top of trees. Girls don't do this and that. So that alone, they're already boxing you in on how a girl is supposed to behave, how you're supposed to maintain yourself. And all that, it, it, it takes some, some sort of like an esteem in you, the process uh, that you have, the processor, it's, 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 it's boxed in. You don't, and before you do anything else, you have to think twice. What will the next person say about me? Would they judge me and say I'm not behaving like a female? I'm supposed to behave in a certain manner and belong in the kitchen. So with me, yes, I would say definitely. At home, I'll be, I'll be told. I don't get to get on top of trees. I don't have to be on the back of the bike while it's moving. That restrained me from doing a lot of things. Only now I am learning to unlearn certain things. Yeah, I, I can resonate with what you're saying, coming from a very um, conservative community uh, where you judge by, you know, you put in certain boxes um, and, and it, you, that, re, that translates to you later on in life, in, uh, going into a work environment and how you carry yourself forward. Um, Teho, how about you, um, your... May I just talk to what Humbalani said um, there in, uh, just for a moment, because it's something that as adults we take for granted. So when we hear that we talk back when we were a little kid and I was climbing the trees and then mom like shouted at me or whatnot, it sounds very straightforward, okay? Sounds very straightforward intellectually to us as adults. But what you want, what, what you want to do is put yourself in the shoes of that little Humbalani. She was like climbing the trees, having fun, filled with joy and excitement and stuff, just being herself. And then suddenly out of the blue comes this parent who's supposed to be the source of, of, of safety and comfort and understanding and comes and screams at you. You don't behave like that if you're a girl. Wah, 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 wah. That child in that moment experiences overwhelming, almost life-threatening, and here's the important part, fear. 
Yeah. And it doesn't understand. Hold on, I'm having fun. I'm doing what my brothers are doing. What's wrong with this? There's no explanation or whatnot. And in that moment, the pattern, the coping pattern is born. I cannot do anything because just out of nowhere, a curveball can come and I can be hurt. I can be hit over the head. I can be humiliated. I can be criticized. I can be shamed in front of other people. And from that moment on, the fear is instilled. So every time I want to do something that everyone else is doing, is there going to be a curveball that's coming? So it was a beautiful example. Thank you, Humbalani, for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. It's for that insight as well, Veronique. And I think it just um, took me back to a work environment um, where you say your colleagues often mirror that because you find that when you have a leader um, that is leading somebody who, who struggles with that, um, and they don't nurture uh, or they don't create an environment that's nurturing, you will still continue with that fear of what if there's a curveball? So I should be careful about how I conduct myself. Because I, I think about, you know, earlier on in my career, uh, being a woman in mining and it being a male dominated environment, there was always this um, this culture, almost this culture that women have to behave and carry themselves in a specific manner. Um, and, and that creates that sense of fear of should I just be authentically me? And I think some of us that progress in our career think are a bit too stubborn and we just want to forge ahead. So you avoid all of those um, issues or those discussions about how women should uh, behave or how people think women should behave um, and, and you, you break through those barriers but you, you then find other individuals or other people that come into that environment that don't have that confidence to do that um, and that creates a bit of um, um, anxiety uh, for an individual in the workplace. And leading to that ironically um, with fear comes a lot of ignorance because when we're in a state of fear, we tend to keep ourselves with blinkers on and in denial. Um, and this then links back to things like diversity. So male versus female, older versus younger, different sexes, the different sexual preferences, different races, different religions. If we're afraid of ourselves and we're living in a state of fear, we're going to have a wall around us. And the minute that we see anything that's different, there's going to be resistance. Yeah. So a, a, very, a very simple tip that, that you can use and apply to anything, work-related, personal-related, or anything, in a word, is curiosity. So whenever difference pops up, if you've got a question to ask and you don't know how to ask it, or you're worried you're going to look stupid, or you've observed something or whatnot, just put it into a question format. Because by putting it into a question format, you immediately elevate the people or the person that you're asking. And you're also being humble because you're going, you, you're protecting yourself because you're asking a question. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, Therefore, just in terms of um, your experience of identifying where it comes from. So for, for me, I guess I, I identified, you know, the one of the slides that um, Bernie shared about the, the soloist. So I grew up as the, as the only child. So um, I, I was almost like always trying to take out in a way and, you know, probably very nice. And he was making me wow, so that I had to like, you know, in a in, uh, place, in, as, you, as you can imagine. So when, when, when going into like a work environment, then you end up not even being able to actually share that, like, oh, maybe I'm, I'm lacking here, I need some help, some mentorship um, yeah. and, and guidance. So a, a lot of it came from that. And also growing up in a township, you know, the township environment is really uh, not conducive to learning. Um, it's almost uh, it's almost a system that just keeps you in a, in a cocoon and you just do what you see. And yes. it created a lot of rebellion in me. Um, I remember I wasn't always this fantastic employee I am today. <laughs> there were times <laughs> where I would, uh, I remember this one time, I, I, I even got uh, sit, sat down by my managers and I was given 
an intervention, which I'm embarrassed to talk about, but I know this is a safe space. <laughs> but uh, I didn't know etiquette in the office. You know, I, I just, because I was always in the field, when I came to the office, I was like, oh, here's, I'm going to make friends. I didn't understand that I need to now develop business. I'm no, I'm no longer now on holiday, just logging call or mapping, you know. And I remember I had to go through that whole um, intervention where they sat me down to say, hey, man, in the office, this is how we, this is how we do things. And it was embarrassing um, for me, you know. Um, this is when I was at uh, DMT, Kavata, and a lot of the seniors at the time are good friends of mine today. And I was even invited to their 15th year anniversary to show that. I actually listened afterwards. I actually pulled up my socks. But yeah, your environment has a lot to do with it. You know, like those times where I wouldn't listen much or I would just do my own thing. I, I learned I learned a lot from it. And and yeah, it, it has to do with, with how we grew up. I agree with very I, I think uh, what's important to take away from that is that you can um, accept that somebody could call you up on it and that you actually um, take heed of what they're saying and use that opportunity to improve your own circumstances within a work environment. Often enough, people don't handle that. Um, and, and that also um, is something that we need to introspect on. So we're going to need to point on it's your relationship with yourself and knowing yourself and having the emotional intelligence to know exactly when to react to and then how to react in certain circumstances. Um, thank you, Seho, for that. I will really can, um, let you continue with your um, presentation. Seho, I also just want to um, commend you and acknowledge you for your vulnerability because um, you can see that there's like 43 people on this, this call right now and, and it takes it takes quite a lot of courage to voice what you did and be vulnerable and say those things. Um, so I'd like to commend you on that. Um, and link to what you've said, if you don't mind, you used the word rebellion. And rebellion, you can, I, I don't know if you can all see, but behind the word rebellion is the emotion of anger. And ironically, anger usually shows up when there is deep rooted fear that we don't know how to show and tackle. So anger as an emotion shows up almost as a shield to protect ourselves and to keep people away. It's universal. It's the same amongst animals. It's all cultures, all nations, whether you speak the same language or not. Anger shows up as a means to protect myself, my autonomy. I've got to take care of myself. I've got to survive. Um, but in our society, in our world, anger is shunned upon and you are then ridiculed and shamed once again, which again adds to the perpetual cycle of being the, the, the hamster on the, on, the, on the spinning wheel, when really what somebody with anger needs is somebody who's willing to say, okay, I can see that you're angry. What's going on? Tell me about that. What's driving this anger? What are you protecting yourself from? And then the conversation has a lot more value. If you look at a kid that's throwing a tantrum, a teenager that's throwing a tantrum, it's because they're trying to own their autonomy, but they don't know how. Yeah. So they I was going into a corporate space, wanting, having been an only child, having basically to raise himself, not having anyone to guide him, show him how to deal with big emotions or even help him tackle stuff. Because as he said, it wasn't always easy to, to even go to people in the township and ask for help because they couldn't answer the questions that he wanted to. So he was kind of like this individual in this massive world on his own. So he did it and then he got into a corporate space, but he still got all those survival coping mechanisms that he picked up along the way um, that, that are now ingrained. And suddenly yeah. someone called him up and said, dude, you can't be like that. So he's kind of just putting himself out there, trial and error, and at least he's um, emotionally mature enough to take the direction when he gets it. And some yeah. people don't take the direction when they get it. But underneath it all is the sense of, I just want to be a human being. I just want to be seen and valued and appreciated for who I am. And I don't want to be scared to do that. And so, I think, on, Veronique, on that point, um, you make a very important point around having that crucial conversation at the time where somebody's displaying anger and, and trying to un unpack what is causing that outburst or that frustration at that moment because um and that makes a difference with the type of leadership and i think organizations need to focus on that um, crucial conversation 
um, training uh, for leaders within an organization to be able to guide employees within their space um, better. Mm. Uh, because when you have somebody who just doesn't, who thinks you're just having an outburst or you're just being dramatic about something, as opposed to trying to unpack and understand what is causing that. And that would, you know, go a, a, a longer way as opposed to just dismissing it for an outburst or an, um, and, and dismissing you for having anger issues. So I think that's Absolutely. quite important. Absolutely. And, and it's these sessions that you guys are having that are so valuable so that we can start to have these conversations and kind of go, hey, we're all just being human. We're not the only one struggling with this. You know, we're, we all have so much common ground. And, yeah. and when, you, when you're speaking this and we all put our hand up on that first slide, it's like there's, you know, 45 people and it's like, oh, God, we all got imposter syndrome. Like, wow, so I'm not alone in this. Now we can talk about it. Now the fear doesn't seem so overwhelming. I mean, in the corporate world, uh, for example, men um, struggle a lot with bottling up anger because men are like not allowed to be angry. They carry a lot of shame, so they bottle it all up. And what happens when you bottle something up? Eventually it explodes, right? And then again, they get shamed and again, you're in the cycle. Women, on the other hand, and, I, and I'm generalizing, which is a dangerous thing to do, but women tend to be more insecure in terms of the, the, the suppression that, that we had in history, you know, that we, we, we have a place in the home as a mother, you can't be a career woman, um, you get paid less than a man for the same knowledge, for the same expertise. expertise. So, so there's insecurity attached to it. I have to prove myself more. I have to show up. I have to work harder for the same thing. But at yeah. the end of it, when you filter it all down, you can sit and play with those conversations as a starting point and you can go on for days and years and never resolve it. At the end of the day, it's who am I and what am I afraid of? And if you tackle that, you liberate yourself. Sure. May, I, may I continue with the slides or do, should we chat? I think, no, let's continue. I'm just mindful of time as well. So let's continue. I just want to okay. leave some at the end for some questions to the listeners. Okay. So two slides left. So really, at the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to reinstate a sense of wholeness, because if we feel whole as an individual, then we feel fulfilled and happy, right? Um, yeah. Oops, I just accidentally went back. So the only way to do that is if what you think intellectually in your head, which is the stuff that's programmed into you, and the way that you feel in your body, so you're not having anxiety or anger and, and all of those things, and what you do in terms of my actions make me have a sense of belonging and connectedness, when those three things are aligned then you've reinstated wholeness and happiness. And then no matter what life throws you or whatever happens, you have that sense of groundedness and balance. So what's the solution? Then? I mean, it all sounds very straightforward, right? Like we've all got fear. We just need a holistic approach. So what's the solution? It's a holistic solution. We've got to look at it from a physical, a mental, and a spiritual aspect. And a lot of people, when they have problems, um, or they notice patterns. So say, for example, they're always anxious, always anxious, always anxious. Then they go to the psychiatrist, they get pills for anxiety. And for the next 20 years of their life, they're on pills for anxiety. And the resolve is never, is never there. Yeah. Or um, they start eating emotionally and they put on a lot of weight. And um, then they're like, okay, no, I need to go to gym. So physically they go to gym and they go to di a dietitian and they lose all the weight. But still, that sense of wholeness and fulfillment and resolve isn't there because the three are always interlinked. The three are always yeah. interlinked. And for each person, it's completely unique. So it's about you understanding yourself as an individual and what you physically, mentally, and spiritually need to feel whole. So if we take fear, for example, because that was the emotion that underpins imposter syndrome. If you, um, like if, if I know that I struggle with that, what do I need physically to deal with my fear? I might need to go for a half an hour walk at the end of each day. I might need to spend 10 minutes breathing, consciously breathing, taking deep breaths into my belly. I might need to make sure that I eat more whole foods and stay away from junk food, for example. 
I might need to know on a spiritual level, some people will feel that they need that connectedness through religion and church, for example. Another person may spiritually connect through nature or going through walks in nature or swimming in rivers or um, doing something like that to feel spiritually connected or even something creative. And then mentally, and this is the important thing, and I'm so glad in our world now it's becoming more popular, but to be able to become aware of your thoughts and mm -hmm. to actually talk about them. Because what people don't realize is when you are born as a baby, you have a spiritual and you have a physical birthright connection. The mental stuff is programmed into your head from the day that you're born. Yet we spend 95% of our time in our head and ignoring our spiritual and our body and our physical. So can you see by just changing the focus to consider all three, we start to change the dynamic of our life. Because when you start to change your holistic togetherness, then you start to engage with the world differently. And then the world starts to engage with you differently. Okay. So it starts with the awareness of self. So here's a couple of questions. You can take a screen grab. We can discuss them just now because I think there's only one or two slides left. Um, but what are the core beliefs that you hold about yourself? And a core belief could be, I am stupid, when really you've got four PhDs, for example. That could be a core belief that you hold, but it's not necessarily true. So what are your core beliefs? And are they true? And are they even yours? Because you might think you're stupid because you had a mom or a dad that called you stupid all the time, which drove you to study harder, which drove you to get five different degrees and PhDs. But in your head, you're still hearing mom or dad's voice going, you're stupid. So no matter how much you study, no matter how many people tell you how clever you are or how educated you are, until you change that core belief, you're, you're not going to get that sense of peace. Who do you have to forgive what do you need to let go of? So many of us are carrying stuff around with us as adults that we've been carrying around since we were a teenager. It could be a hurt, a personal invasion of our body. Somebody, for example, who's been raped, who hasn't dealt with the pain of that rape, it will manifest everywhere because that person will never feel secure in a meeting with a male or a female that raped them. They will be suspicious of every person that they see that this potentially could be someone that will hurt them like that again. So what do we need to forgive and what do we need to let go of? Are you living your life or are you living your family or society's expectation of you? I deal with so many people on a daily basis who are in what looks like successful jobs and careers who are making a lot of money driving fancy cars and are miserably unhappy because they actually didn't want to be a CFO. They wanted to have a nursery, nursery and you know, deal with little kids or they wanted to have a nursery and deal with plants. But because mom and dad said you need to be a CFO or, or a lawyer in order to be something in this world, they're living out mom's um, fantasy. And it's making them miserably happy. And the question I want to ask you guys here is that at the end of the day, when you die, it doesn't matter whether you were a lawyer or you were growing plants. The way people remember you is whether you were happy, the impact that you made on other people, the way you made people feel. So if you are not happy, if you are not living your truth, if you are not inspired or loving what you're doing, there's absolutely no way that you will touch and inspire other people because you won't have time for other people because you'll be so consumed with your own misery. So that's a, yeah, that's a big question to ask yourself. But Another one is, do, yes, yeah, sorry. I, I, you know, on the topic of forgiveness, I see there's a message in, in the chat that's quite uh, relevant Thank that you. says you need to forgive yourself. Um, and absolutely. I think we can do that. Mm, absolutely. And even if you go back to the example I gave of the rape, so many women have forgot, like almost two, and men, because men even get raped these days. They've almost, they'll say, I've forgiven that person, like they don't feature in my life anymore. But there's a part that they're holding on to where, why did I bring that upon myself? 
Like, yeah. What did I do that brought that upon me? Um, and and a lot of forgiveness may be a topic that we could discuss in another session because a lot of people actually don't know how to forgive. A lot of people do not know how to forgive and let go. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Whoever said that, absolutely spot on. Another one is, do you accept yourself as you are? If you ask yourself, do I love and accept myself completely as I am? If I look in the mirror, can I look in my eyes and say, I love you as you are? Yeah. And most of us usually say no. So until we can love the parts of us, the nigglies, the warts, the freckles, the, the everything, and understand that that's part of what makes you uniquely you and your story, again, that fear is going to stay there. And then the typical question, what are your greatest fears and where do they come from? Like when um, um, Ambalani shared the story of when she was a little girl and she was climbing the trees and then she was told, you know, girls don't climb trees. We can, we can almost giggle about that now because we can see the scenario play out. But as a little maybe six, seven year old girl who was just having fun with her brothers, that is absolutely traumatic experience. Yeah. And um, if we're not aware of those little tiny nuances that very often we even laugh about when we think back, but don't stop and go, hold on. There was a five-year-old or an eight-year-old at one point who experienced this as petrifying, scary, and traumatic. Then we can't release ourselves from those hurts and we carry them with us. Sure. Um, I think one, one important point around self-awareness is um, the acceptance that we have, um, all of us have a certain makeup and all of us coming into a work environment uh, will need to adapt to change, will need to adapt who we are. Uh, but the most important lesson that I take away from this, uh, Veronique, is that you need to be authentically you. You need to accept that you will fail at things. You need to accept that um, you need to work on your on your being um, and to, to love yourself um, and, and have passion for what you're doing and that will translate into um, success in any environment for that matter. So, so mm -hmm. thank you for that. I think that's quite pertinent. Yeah, and what fills you up? What gives you joy? You won't believe how many people cannot answer that question. They'll normally say my, like the salary that I get at the end of the month or my kids give me joy. But can you see all of those are outside of you? Like, what gives you joy? Is it the scent of coffee? Is it hearing the wind in the trees? Is it a sense of freedom? Like, um, when I lived in Dubai for 10 years, and I only realized when I got back to South Africa, that the one thing that I'd missed so much is just being able to open the windows in the morning and breathe fresh air. Because in Dubai, 80, 90% of the time, you live with the windows closed in air conditioning. Yeah. And just being able to open windows and feel the crispness of air and breathe actual air that's not air conditioned, it gave the word freedom for me an entire different meaning. Yeah. yeah. Another question you, is, oh, sorry. Reflect, sorry, re, I think you're also touching on another point is to constantly reflect on our environment and where we flourish um, in the type of environments. I think it, it takes me back to uh, my a current situation where I worked for 19 years at a specific operation within our business and then suddenly I was asked to move to a, a new operation and I think the anxiety and the fear that came with that is um, you know would I cope in that environment uh, will people accept me will I make a difference and and because you're so driven and working in an HR environment where you're constantly interacting with different stakeholders um, mm. you know so you have to often reflect and think, you know, I, I'm going to bloom where I'm planted. Uh, and once you believe you're going to do that, then it's easy to translate your entire being and who you are um, within, within your workspace. It comes down to the word choice. When you're conscious yes. of a choice that you make, then you've empowered yourself. If you're yes. not conscious that at any moment you have a choice, you might say, I don't have a choice because I have to stay in this job because I need the money, for example. You yeah. always have a choice. You've got the choice to stay in a job you don't want to be in or a choice to walk away and, and, and trust that something better will come along. There's always a choice. Yeah. 
Thank which you. brings us on to the next question if money and time were no object how would you actually spend your time would you be doing what you're doing now if 80 percent of your time was spent doing what you're doing would you be doing the same thing and that ultimately all of those questions sum up into one question, who are you? When you remove your name, your title, your education, your parents, your kids, the house that you live in, the car that you drive or don't drive, whatever the case may be, who are you? What is left? So there's some powerful questions for you guys to consider. And just to wrap up, um, if the slide would move, because it's now having a wobbly and <laughs> being stuck, why is it not? Oh, there we go. So in a nutshell, it comes down to four things, really, if you want to tackle this. It's about addressing your fears, confronting them and addressing them. So through the awareness that we discussed in the previous slide, you can be aware of your fears and therefore you can address them. And you can do that through things with, uh, through things like talk therapy, through counseling, through journaling through gratitude, through reflection, through mirror work, through coaching. There are many different avenues that, that you can take, but it does usually involve some form of reflection. So if you wanna do it on your own, you write it and then see it back. Or you have a person sitting in front of you who mirrors it back. There has yeah. to be a reflection. The other thing is to learn when you're going on that journey, you'll see that there are things that are getting in the way. What's making me angry? For example, what am I holding on to? You might be getting annoyed with a boss at the office, but really you're carrying anger from your dad that you were annoyed at who used to do the same thing with you. And now you're taking it out on your boss, for example. So forgiveness and letting go is part of the process. And also linked to that, like we saw with the example with the tree climbing, is the inner aspect work, or what's also known as inner child work, where you connect with parts of yourself that you left behind a long time ago, that you put a big shield around, and that you're carrying into adulthood whilst you're trying to survive and achieve. So it all boils down to reconnecting with that remarkable, unique truth that is you by birthright, because there's no one else in the whole wide world who is youer than you, as Dr. Zhu said. And when you get to that point, that is your absolute true point of power. And just um, to tell you a teeny tiny smidge about me, um, the introduction earlier said that I'm a coach. I am a master coach, but I'm also a counselor. I deal particularly with the work that we shared here today. I tackle um, things like trauma counseling and stuff. So I'm a holistic trauma counselor. I'm also a Heal Your Life teacher licensed through the United States. I do hold a degree in psychology, but I do not, um, I do not subscribe to the conventional one-sided mental only approach. I believe in the holistic approach of looking at the person as a whole and what they need holistically. And I also do Enneagram, NBI profiling, and various other things. I'm accredited both through the ICF as well as Comensa. So there's a little bit about me. That's that's all. And um, yeah, any questions? Such a pleasure so, to be here to share all of this with you. I could I could tell from your entire presentation the fashionista in 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 this oh. topic. <laughs> so, yeah, um, thank you so much. Um, I see there's a, a comment by Brioni in our chat that says, in my experience, uh, Patu, it starts with actively practicing compassion from a young version of you, the little person that develops the coping mechanisms that um, you use as an adult and that you keep safe with. And that, that kept you safe and then that harm you now. So, I, I, Brioni, I just, I, if you, if everyone could just have a look at the chat, um, I think there's some important um, chats or points that are made, uh, uh, Veronique, to you, talking to your points and saying very insightful information and a lot of people resonating with both um, Tseho and uh, Humadani's experience through um, their work careers as well. Are there any questions? Um, if we, if there's anyone on the floor that has questions that they'd like to raise, Shane, um, I see you've got your hand up. You're welcome to post your question. Hi, Veronique, um, and all of the the hosts for tonight. I really enjoyed it so much. Just a question with regards to what does it look like if you don't have imposter syndrome? Then what? <laughs> <laughs> what is that person like then? Is it someone that's very confident in themselves or yeah, maybe you can elaborate on that. 
So that's an interesting question. Um, we can tackle this from so many different um, from so many different angles. I think part of the the main problem, and it, I'm going to go on a limb here, is that psychology and psychiatry and the world that we live in loves labels. And labels like imposter syndrome or depression or anxiety or man, woman, whatever the case may be, puts a box over here with criteria. And it takes away from the humanity and the wholeness of an individual. Okay, so that's the first point. Why am I saying that? When you are born as a baby, and even that's debatable because it depends on what goes on in the womb. Did your mom have a traumatic uh, pregnancy? Were your parents addicts? Was there a lot of drama going on in the house? So even when the fetus is developing, um, there can be trauma, right? And uh, on an even bigger limb, there can be even generational bro trauma brought down through DNA and all sorts of things that goes back five generations. So... I don't think anyone comes out unscathed. That's my personal view. We just have varying degrees of how scathed we are. Um, so one could make a, an assumption that a baby is born pure, whole, and complete, and that from day of birth, um, environment, schooling, religion, parenting, sickness, all of these things can start to shape how we start to cope and operate in the world, which is very much true. And things like your, your physical makeup um, and all of that will contribute to how successfully you will develop those coping, those ways of coping. And sometimes, and very often actually, uh, we tend to develop dysfunctional coping mechanisms that help us survive to a point. And then um, Carl Jung, who was a famous psychologist, coined the term um, midlife crisis, which usually happens between the age of 35 and 45, where suddenly everyone's kind of going, well, hold on a second, something is off here. Like there's just something off. And, and that is usually where who you were born to be is fighting harder with the person that you created to survive in this world. So I don't know if that answers your question. It's, it's an interesting question and um, it can be unpacked in so many ways, but I don't believe that anyone is born unscathed. I think to some degree, everyone has elements of imposter syndrome, um, but it's about uh, part of, I guess, growing up is being able to recognize those dysfunctional aspects of ourselves and kind of go, ooh, Instead of criticizing or shaming myself here, oh, there's an opportunity to learn and integrate. And that really defines um, sort of whether you're whole or still disintegrated. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, Shane, does that um, answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from anyone on the chat or, or on the platform? Don't see any other questions. Um, so before we close up, I just would like to um, say for perhaps for you to share any closing comments on this topic, and then I'll ask Humlani as well to just share with us any closing comments. Um, thanks, thanks for Tina, and thanks everyone uh, for having me. Um, I've, I've learned a lot, and it's been such a good experience uh, just to hear uh, about this topic and unpack why we feel the way we feel and seeing that everyone is actually the same is also like something that's comforting. Um, but I think also Shane's question now also, I guess it's, she, she also maybe wants to know what's the goal, right? Um, will we ever get to a place where we don't experience as much impost imposter syndrome? And I guess um, it, it, it comes with just growing through it and using all those um, in uh, like feelings of uh, um, not being good enough and just turning them upside down and making them um, your, 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 your own um, brand. You know, sometimes uh, we feel like our, 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 our shortcomings are actually um, can, can negatively impact our growth at work, for example, but only to find that some of your failures could actually inspire 
others and could actually elevate you. Um, I, I remember actually when when I uh, crossed paths with Brian and that's when actually my mindset shifted because I, I had left my job as a geologist, the one that I had got in all the disciplinary stuff and all of that. And I went into uh, selling food and that's where I actually learned the hard crafts of actually just smiling to people, asking, asking for favors and hustling with my back against the wall. And when I implemented that in, in my job I, and sharing my experience in my job, which that at the time I, I thought I had failed with the food business because I had to close down and give away all my equipment and go look for a real job. But after sharing that experience, people actually started valuing me and saying, oh, this guy's entrepreneurial. We could give him some business uh, development work. We could give him some opportunities to grow certain sectors in the, in the company. So some of those in, uh, inefficiencies that I had started becoming strengths. So that's something I wanted to share as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that um, again, Seho. And also just uh, it talks back to the point that Veronique was making is understanding yourself and how you can best deal with circumstances in a, you know, in a certain situation and how to overcome that um, and finding yourself and finding your true purpose and where your passion mm -hmm. lies in order to be successful. So thank you so much. And, and we really appreciate having you on this platform and, and sharing your insights with us and your experience with us. Um, it's been really, uh, valuable. I really value that. Thank you. Humilani, um, I'd like to hear from you um, in terms of closing comments. Um, we, we really appreciated you being open to your experience and I'd really like to hear from you um, in closing comments. Thank you so much, uh, Fatima. If anything that uh, came out that stood out for me is that it is normal uh, for me to feel insecure at times. I need to embrace it and use it. Uh, I need to uh, see it as um, an opportunity to be saying, uh, maybe this is uh, an opportunity for me to learn a new skill. And I need to believe and keep on telling myself that I am meant to be here. Uh, you know, it's better to try than not to know at all. So um, I've learned that criticism, it doesn't always mean that uh, it equals to failure. I need to take matters in a positive manner. So um, yeah, I've quite learned quite a lot. Thank you for all the insightful uh, information that uh, I've learned today. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I see there's a lot of um, comments on the chat as well. Um, appreciating you saying it needs to be with heart. So self-awareness with heart. So understanding fully um, and investing in yourself and understanding you as a, as a being, as a being in an environment um, and projecting that in any space that you are um, in to enable you to be successful. So uh, Humlani, thank you so much for your time and for your insights this evening. It's really been a pleasure hosting you on this platform. Um, I also noticed on the chat, Raksha, that um, there was a question around uh, the recording, uh, which will be shared on our WOMSA platform uh, for everyone to access. Am I correct? That's correct, yep. Well. Right. So uh, without, uh, there aren't any further questions, Raksha, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to hand over back to you. I'd just like to thank everybody that has taken time to join us this evening. Um, it's a very interesting subject. I think the time allocated um, to discuss such a huge topic, um, we definitely have to um, continue this discussion. Um, in our opening, we mentioned that many organizations don't talk to imposter syndrome. Um, it's not a topic that's often spoken about. And perhaps uh, going back to our environments to encourage more discussion on that. Um, the second poll that we ran, um, majority of the incumbents that have attended this evening said they've experienced imposter syndrome. Um, I see you're running a third poll now. Um, would you like to know more about this topic? And um, we've got um, in-person event, um, yes, 58% uh, or it's 54% that are saying yes, an in-person event uh, or virtual event, 50%. So there the is yes to further discussions on this matter. And I think 
uh, as WIMSA, we will definitely take heed of this poll and, and put something together and communicate that on our platform. Yeah, I think, I think there's definitely a need to continue this one, Fatima. I think to echo all of the comments and the sentiments of everyone in the chat box, I think we were all so blown away by some of the learnings that we took today. And I think it's a, a lot of reflection for us all to, to go back and, and, and look at as well as we introspect. Um, Seko Humbalani, thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate you being part of this discussion. Um, really, really, really appreciate it. And Veronique, yeah, gosh, wow. It, I was so blown away when we first had our conversation as well, and I just learned so much more. This is a topic that's very close to me, and I suffer a lot with this um, on a daily basis. So I've got a, a lot of learnings that I've gotten. Made lots of notes as well. So um, I look forward to delving deeper into it. I think we definitely will explore this conversation, guys. I think there's a lot of feedback that we've got, and we'll just work out what's the best way to do it. And yes, this will be shared on all of our social platforms. So please share this with friends, family, colleagues. I think everyone can benefit a hell of a lot from this discussion. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, as always. And we look forward to seeing you guys on, on other WIMSA events. Uh, Fatima, thank you so much for facilitating this. Thank you, Raksha. It's been if yes. I could make one suggestion, um, because I sense that just hearing Humbalani and, and Sejo's um, personal stories, how it opens up the conversation and shows this common ground and this humanity that we all have, that it might also be beneficial to have a session where people can show up and, you know, maybe there's just 10 minutes where we take a topic like fear, for example, and we mm -hmm. ask the question, when was the first time you experienced fear or when was the first time you were humiliated or um, when was the first time you weren't allowed to demonstrate anger, for example, because you saw from today's session, there are so many mm -hmm. nuggets that can be unpacked and have a conversation where maybe more people could share some of their stories and show a little bit more of their humanity if they're willing because we grow we grow together like that you know the world that we live in we're all we're all hurting everyone's hurting in some way or another but we see someone who looks polished in a beautiful suit and we just assume they're okay but next week, that might be the guy who hangs himself because he doesn't know how to get through um, the fact that he lost his wife, for example, you know. So, yeah, it, it, it might be a good idea to, to, to give people a voice and a safe space where they know they're being heard and understood and allowed to be. 100%. And I think we spoke about creating a series of this uh, when we chatted the last time. And, and I think that's the whole the whole premise of what WIMSA is about is creating that safe space for, for people to be vulnerable and to share some of their fears and insecurities. So, so I think definitely we'll, we'll be seeing you for, uh, for sure in a couple other sessions as we plan this. Um, and, and yes, we, we'll, we'll definitely put something together because I think there's a need and, and there's an opportunity here for us to try and, you know, um, yeah, share our truths and have those honest conversations that we need to. Raksha, and just on that point saying, you know, what is WIMSA? about I, I really appreciate the fact that Seho being uh, you know a male colleague of ours that has been um, so accommodating to come into this platform and I want to encourage um, everyone that has joined us this evening that when we do share these opportunities that it's just not a females attending because I think it impacts the broader um, society uh, you know in a work environment and if I, we bring on our male colleagues to this platform it just makes the transition in the workplace so much easier uh, when we share the same sentiments and we share the same understanding of things so I just want to encourage that. Definitely. Seko you set the trend hey. Thank you thank you so much yeah, it's, yeah. I mean we see we would we suffer more as men. I think it was Veronique who mentioned how men bottle up our emotions and they blow up as a suicide, as a family, GBV, as as all these other things that we see. But yeah, we, we need we need this more than you guys. <laughs> For sure. Thanks. Well, thanks everybody. Have a great evening and we'll definitely chat again soon. So thanks again, everyone. Thank Bye, you. Everyone.